Uh, my starting point when it comes to the consideration of any issue relating to free speech is my passionate belief that the second most precious thing in life is the right to express yourself freely. The most precious thing in life, I think, is food in your mouth. And the third most precious is a roof over your head. But a fixture for me in the number two slot is free expression just below the need to sustain life itself. That is because I have enjoyed free expression in this country all my professional life and fully expect to continue to do so. Personally, I suspect highly unlikely to be arrested for whatever laws exist to contain free expression because of the undoubtedly privileged position that is afforded to those of a high public profile. So my concerns are less for myself and more for those more vulnerable because of their lower profile like the man arrested in Oxford for calling a police horse gay, <laughs> or the teenager arrested for calling the Church of Scientology a cult, or the cafe owner arrested for displaying passages from the Bible on a TV screen. When I heard of some of these more ludicrous offences and charges, I remembered that I had been here before in a fictional context. I once did a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News some years ago, and we did a sketch where Griff Rhys Jones played Constable Savage, a manifestly racist police officer <laughs> to whom I, as his station commander, is giving a dressing down for arresting a black man on a whole string of ridiculous, trumped up and ludicrous charges. The charges for which Constable Savage arrested Mr. Winston Kodogo of 55 Mercer Road were these. Walking on the cracks in the pavement. <laughs> Walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area during the hours of darkness. And one of my favourites, walking around all over the place. <laughs> he was also arrested for urinating in a public convenience and looking at me in a funny way. Who would have thought that we would end up with a law that would allow life to imitate art so exactly. I read somewhere a defender of the status quo claiming that the fact that the gay horse case was dropped after the arrested man refused to pay the, uh, to pay the fine and that the Scientology case was also dropped at some point during the court process was proof that the law was working well, <laughs> ignoring the fact that the only reason these cases were dropped was because of the publicity that they had attracted. The police sensed that ridicule was just around the corner and withdrew their actions. But what about the thousands of other cases that did not enjoy the oxygen of publicity, that weren't quite ludicrous enough to attract media attention? Even for those actions that were withdrawn, people were arrested, questioned, taken to court, and then released. You know, that isn't a law working properly. That is censoriousness of the most intimidating kind, guaranteed to have, as Lord Deer says, a chilling effect on free expression and free protest. Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights summarized, as you may know, this whole issue very well by saying, while arresting a protester for using <coughs> threatening or abusive speech may, depending on the circumstances, be a proportionate response we do not think that language or behavior that is merely insulting should ever be criminalized in this way. The clear problem with the outlawing of insult is that too many things can be interpreted as such. Criticism is easily construed as insult by certain parties. Ridicule easily construed as insult. Sarcasm, unfavorable co comparison, merely stating an alternative point of view to the orthodoxy can be interpreted as insult. And because so many things can be interpreted as insult, it is hardly surprising that so many things have been, as the examples I talked about earlier show. Although the law under discussion has been on the statute book for over 25 years, it is indicative of a culture that has taken hold of the programs of successive governments that, with the reasonable and well-intentioned ambition to contain obnoxious elements in society has created a society of an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. 
That is what you might call the new intolerance, a new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. I am not intolerant, say many people, say many softly spoken, highly educated, liberal-minded people. I'm only intolerant of intolerance. <laughs> And people tend to nod sagely and say, oh, yes, wise words, wise words. And yet if you think about this supposedly inarguable statement for longer than five seconds, you realize that all it is advocating is the replacement of one kind of intolerance with another, which to me doesn't represent any kind of progress at all. Underlying prejudices, injustices, or resentments are not addressed by arresting people. They are addressed by the issues being aired, argued and dealt with, preferably outside the legal process. For me, the best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow a lot more of it. As with childhood diseases, you can better resist those germs to which you have been exposed. We need to build our immunity to taking offense so that we can deal with the issues that perfectly justified criticism can raise. Our priority should be to deal with the message, not the messenger. As President Obama said in an address to the United Nations only a month or so ago, laudable efforts to restrict speech can become a tool to silence critics or oppress minorities. The strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech. And that's the essence of my thesis, more speech. <clears throat> if we want a robust society, we need more robust dialogue, and that must include the right to insult or to offend. And as, even if, as Lord Deere says, you know, the freedom to be inoffensive is no freedom at all. The repeal of this word in this clause will be only a small step, but it will, I hope, be a critical one in what should be a longer-term project to pause and slowly rewind a creeping culture of censoriousness. It is a small skirmish in the battle, in my opinion, to deal with what Sir Salman Rushdie refers to as the outrage industry. Self-appointed arbiters of the public good, encouraging media-stoked <coughs> outrage to which the police feel under terrible pressure to react. A newspaper rings up Scotland Yard. Someone has said something slightly insulting on Twitter about someone who we think a national treasure. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and the police panic and they scrabble around and then grasp the most inappropriate lifeline of all, Section 5 of the Public Order Act, that thing where you can arrest anybody for saying anything that might be construed by anyone else as insulting. You know, they don't seem to need a real victim. They need only to make the judgment that somebody could have been offended if they had heard or read what has been said. The most ludicrous degree of latitude. The storms that surround Twitter and Facebook comment have raised some fascinating issues about free speech, which we haven't really yet come to terms with. Firstly, that we all have to take responsibility for what we say, which is quite a good lesson to learn. But secondly, we've learned how appallingly prickly and intolerant society has become of even the mildest adverse comment. The law should not be aiding and abetting this new intolerance. Free speech can only suffer if the law prevents us from dealing with its consequences. I offer my wholehearted support to the Reform Section 5 campaign. Thank you very much. As you're halfway through your meal, you suddenly recognize a man at a nearby table. He's an author. His name is Salman Rushdie. What do you do? Depends on my mood that evening. I mean, I may concentrate more on my meal, or I may concentrate on the... I can't answer that very clearly. You don't think that this man deserves to die? Who? Salman Rushdie? Yes. Yes, yes. And do, do you have a duty to... Be his executioner. Um, 
No, not necessarily, unless we were in an Islamic state and I was ordered, let's say, by the uh, judge or by the authority to carry out such a, an act, perhaps, yes? Yes. Gets on the front page of the Independent. Weeks later, nothing has happened. The book is still in stock. They hold, come to you and say, we want to hold another demonstration. March to the town hall. This time, we're going to burn an effigy. An effigy of the author. Would you be part of that protest, Yusuf Islam? Would you go to a demonstration where you knew that an effigy was going to be burnt? I would have hoped that it would be the real thing, but actually, no, if it's just an effigy, I don't think I'd be that moved to go there. You can say whatever you like about Islam or the Prophet in the name of free speech, but when other communities and other religions are hurt, suddenly it, it, you can't do it. Suddenly there are limits, and that applies to the Danish... One last point, David. The Danish cartoons, which started this off in 2006, they published those cartoons of the Prophet. Did you know that three years earlier, they were given cartoons mocking Jesus and the resurrection, and the editor said, I won't publish them because they'll provoke an outrage. But outraging Muslims, that's fine. But he wouldn't do it with Jesus. We're, all I'm saying is, let's be consistent you, one way sorry, or the other. You've been going on a very long time. I'm sure did you, 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 look, did you look. Did you look at the last Christmas private eye for mocking Jesus, for mocking Mary, for doing it brilliantly, crudely, coarsely, cleverly? The idea. Well, the private that eye is not the, the equivalent, idea, David, as you know, of Charlie uh, Hebdo. So, but you said that people. You said that there's discrimination against Muslims. This seems to me. I'm saying. This, no, uh, hang on a second. Right, I'm saying right, people wait, use free right, speech all right, all right. as a cover wait, for saying. Let's just go back to I the question. Is, David Starkey. I'm just saying it's rubbish. David Starkey, the question that Hamid. It's not rubbish. I give Bukhari, you a factual example. So just wait. Not rubbish. Hamid Bukhari said free speech is good, but where do you draw the line before it becomes harmful and offensive? What's your answer to his question? You draw it, as it were, as narrowly as possible. <coughs> free speech is the foundation of ev and freedom of thought is the foundation of what we are. It is why, it is why in the last four or five hundred years, this tiny little speck of earth called Europe has transformed the world rethought the world, rethought humanity. And the lack of it, I'm afraid, is why Islam is now primitive and backward after having been glorious. The early days of Islam, when Islam had conquered most of the Roman Empire, when it was dealing with people with the inheritance of Greece, with the inheritance of the Chaldees, with the inheritance of India, Islam was the center of the intellectual universe because it was open. It was diverse, it was welcoming, it accepted challenge. The moment Islam turned on itself, forgot freedom of thought and freedom of speech, it is dying. Nothing has been written in Arabic that matters for at least the last five centuries. But saving the history lesson for a moment. No, because the, no, his, the wait, history wait, lesson... Uh, uh, wait, yeah. wait, the, the question, I said draw the limits as narrowly as possible. Because all right, well, where would you draw them? as narrowly as possible. But, but that's easy to say. What no, do you mean by it? Well, I think the word narrow has got a very clear limit. Well, I should, think, should, right, should, let me, should let me, Charlie Hebdo have, have published course, the cartoon in course, the way they did? Of course. Religion has got no privilege whatever. We heard the Pope today saying that religion is specially privileged. This is nonsense. Why? The idea, the idea that because you feel strongly about something means that nobody must challenge you is an absurdity. People feel, people feel very strongly about stupid things and they hate being challenged. We've heard that already. Um, now, again, I'm going to step right out of line here. In, uh, I'm sure we will hear from Ahmed. In France, there are very strict rules, as there are in most of continental Europe, that you cannot uh, say that the Holocaust did not happen, called Holocaust denial. I would repeal that law completely. It is totally unnecessary. We had a wonderful example. A of, we, had, we had a wonderful example of a man called De David Irving, who was a great Holocaust denier. He was sent to jail in Austria. That made him a martyr. When he sued a publisher who had been published a book which said that he was a liar and a fool, he was taken to pieces by freedom right. of speech by my He's colleague Richard Evans, who okay. shredded him in a way that no law could. Right. 
freedom of speech is us. Anna it's Subri. not I, I think there's a bit of a, Anna Subri. I think there's a bit of a phony argument going on between the two of you, actually. I, I have to say, I agree with everything that Mehdi said, uh, I, and I think he said it beautifully and brilliantly, and I'm, I'm delighted and everybody lied. applauded. No, he didn't lie I at lied. All. You That's lied. Outrageous. You were on Hang record. On, you spoke for were a long on, time. Can someone else record. speak? Oh, uh, sorry. Please. Isn't that free you speech allowing somebody else to have a point of view? You were on Obviously record not. when you That's... were not pre oh, when you were not speaking to an David. audience sorry, like No, I am going to say it. Please do. You were, you oh, were on record as saying to an audience of Muslims that kufiyas are cattle and animals. No. Ye, ye, Sorry, I all thought right, I was right, right, no, right, He David, said that. Right, David, 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 given, given you can't, given you can't get my... And we never lose the moral high ground. If we know anything as Shia of Muhammad, as Shia of Ali, as Shia of Hassan, as Shia of Hussein, we know that keeping the moral high ground is key. Once we lose the moral high ground, we are no different from the rest of the non-Muslims, from the rest of those human beings who live their lives as animals bending any rule to fulfill any desire. Once we do that, we are lost. We are lost. And yet, if it's not anger or rage, it's politics. We justify things politically. Selective quotation of something I said a decade ago. Right. It's not all right, right, David. Leave, leave it, it for a moment. No, 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 David. No, 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 leave it, it, please. It's you're not the only person on this no, panel, as you well know. And, yeah. and also, and also, no, David. Sorry, no. No, David. Sorry, I'm not. I'm really. I'm not going to take lessons from a man who blamed the London riots on black culture and blamed sex crimes on Pakistani culture and now blames terrorism on right. Islam. I'm not going to take lessons in offence or politeness. And the truth is, you're basically, you're basically right. Katie Hopkins with a PhD. Right. You just, just saw saying, for a living. I just take it back, actually. Um, Our founding fathers here in this country brought about the only true revolution that has ever taken place in man's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another set of rulers. But only here did that little band of men so advanced beyond their time that the world has never seen their like since evolve the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and the ability to determine our own destiny. But freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Thank you. Whoever insults Islam or insults the Prophet Muhammad deserves capital punishment. Uh, I believe it was a few years back when um, Pope Benedict made some comments. You, you spoke publicly about uh, anyone insulting the Prophet, you know, deserves to die. Um, if I insulted the Prophet Tom Trento, your new friend here, you know, uh, do, I mean, do I deserve to die? You know, Tom, me and you cannot be friends, but we can have a decent relationship. You know, I can only uh, take as friends those people who believe in Allah and who accept his prophets, you know, but we can have a decent relationship. That doesn't mean we can't smile. You know, I can't buy you a cup of coffee. I can't invite you to become a Muslim and my brother in Islam. But definitely, you know, I can't turn away from the Islamic rulings that uh, the prophet said, whoever insults the prophet, kill him. This is so clear in his narration. Whoever insults Islam or insults the prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam deserves capital punishment.